Oh yeah! It's Mind Pump time! This episode is really, really interesting. We interviewed somebody from the series on HBO Max, Generation Hustle, Ian Bick. This story is remarkable, and I want to hear your comments about the story. Is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? Does he have a future of success? Did he learn his lesson? Comment below in the first 24 hours, and if you leave a good comment, you have a good discussion with other people, and we pick you, you will actually win a MAPS program of your choice. It's the first time we've ever done this. So you actually choose which MAPS program you want if you win. So remember to comment below in the first 24 hours and subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Also, there's only 72 hours left, three days left for our MAPS Prime, MAPS Prime Pro, and Prime Bundle sale. All of them 50% off. The sale ends 72 hours after we drop this episode. Go check them out or just go sign up, mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code June Prime with no space for the discount. All right, enjoy this interview. So, Ian, my man, uh, what I want to do for the audience that uh, doesn't subscribe to HBO Max, uh, first of all, Get out from underneath a rock yeah. and subscribe. Let's to shame the, them. Yeah, no, I'm a, and I don't get paid to say that. I just really think it's one of the best streaming services out there. But I do want you to kind of tell our audience, and, and I'm going to start it off by uh, saying this, and you can respond how you want. So you know, we con 27 people out of a half a million dollars. You get what six? You get charged with six uh, wire fraud, and then one uh, something else. You end up three years in prison is what you do at the age of 19, correct? Yeah, it started when I was 17, but uh, I was indicted at 19. Okay, at 19 is when you were indicted. And then you didn't quite serve all three years. You got out on good behavior, I imagine? Uh, it comes out to you do like 80%, and then you do some halfway house time, which is like an intermediate step, um, kind of like a rehab facility, you could call it. Okay. Um, and then I did a year on home confinement as a part of my uh, conditions of supervised release. And so uh, you got to tell the audience how a 17-year-old a boy that comes from, I, sound, looks like a pretty good, healthy family. Uh, you mm -hmm. look like you have a good relationship with mom and dad. And uh, I'm just assuming, but if it's not <laughs> true, tell me. But how does a 17-year-old kid end up uh, getting three years of prison time and, and indicted for uh, a half, almost a half a million dollars of conning people out of money. I think it really start like the whole story really starts when I'm this young kid who was in, you know in theater camp, and um, I like being on the stage. I like being you know liked. I like being well liked and and that popular like center of attention person. Um, but at the same time, I also had like a like a knack for standing out and kind of like bucking authority. Like in middle school. Um, they said, don't wear flip-flops to school. Of course, I was the kid that was wearing flip-flops. Mm -hmm. um, I had like the shirt from Hollister that said, this is what happens when you party naked. And uh, I was wearing that around. I'd always get like suspended over silly things. And um, that turned into one night, my friend Steven, who, you know, he, he's featured in the documentary. Um, we go and take this insulating foam and foam the president and vice president of our community's uh, cars because they made this rule that said no golf carts. And I was this kid driving around with a golf cart, throwing firecrackers off at people's mailboxes, uh, putting dog poop on a door and, and, and lighting it on fire. Like I was that trouble kid. Uh, we were having like Roman candle wars, you know, shooting bottle rockets at each other. And um, so we do that and we get caught. And ultimately that triggers a domino effect of me getting into this uh, community service, doing this charity um, for community service hours. Uh, which triggers into me throwing house parties and then doing um, these club nights. And that just escalates and escalates and escalates. Well, isn't the, fir the first thing that you did was you actually, part of your uh, charity or the um, your community service, that's the word I was looking for, your community service was you throw, you organize this party and you're, and you're donating it, right? You donate the money and you charge like $20 a head. And isn't that the first big one you throw? Is that right? Yeah. So it started with wristbands, kind of like the Live Strong uh, wristbands. We did it called Fight for the Homeless and they were a dollar a piece. And um, I sell them. We raise a couple thousand dollars and I said, okay, I want to do a school dance. So I'm this, you know, I was 15 at the time and I get a meeting with the principal and I said, listen, I want to do a dance that wasn't on the books for the year because they had like the prom, they had the snowball, uh, homecoming. So they they didn't want any other dances. I convinced the guy, he says yes. 
And um, from there, I, I do this night at the Matrix dance at the Matrix Corporate Center in Danbury, which is like this big elaborate uh, building, which just underwent like $20 million of renovations. And uh, I do the dance. I execute it all on my own. I, I plan it, uh, get about 300 kids to come a- and raise $2,000. Now, did you get them to give you the place for free because you were donating it? Or how did you work that all out? Um, so they gave me a really reduced price and they were at the point where they had no access to other schools because um, they wanted to get everyone's prom and school oh. dance. So they looked at me as an intermediary to, you know, be like that show off person to say, this is a really cool spot, mm. um, which later leads to them offering me a job. And, and I'm 16 at the time getting them these big proms because proms are a big business. It's like $100,000 worth of revenue per prom. Mm. Um, and I was that person stealing it from other venues to bring it to the matrix. Oh, well, wow. that story is not told in the, in the documentary. So you actually end up getting a job with the matrix. And part of your job is to go out and get these proms. For, so how'd that go? How were you successful at it? How long did you do that? So the night of the dance, the uh, owner, his name was, uh, Glenn Nelson, who had passed away a couple of years later, unfortunately. Um, he says, how old are you? And I said, I'm 15. And he's like, when do you turn 16? And I said, uh, in two months. And he said, well, listen, when you're 16, you're working for me. Like no ifs, ands, or buts, like you have a job here. Um, And then I start working there as a houseman, which is like setting up the conference rooms for these big companies, uh, you know, like Praxair and um, all these big companies that had stuff there. I had office space, their GM had office space. And um, I set up meeting rooms. I, I helped with their banquets and weddings. And then they said, well, can you help us, you know, book dances? Um, so I would go, I was vice president of my class. So I was able to take that prom and then I would go to different schools and I would take their proms. Um, and they'd give me a 10% commission and I was making, uh, probably like $10,000 a month just in commission. Um, I mean, it's not every month because it's only prom season, but for like two to three months, at that year and the next year, I was making really good money. Well, I mean, 20, especially as a kid. Yeah, as I yeah. say, twenty to thirty thousand dollars as a kid. I mean, what do you feel like at that point? I mean, you got to be on top of the world. So to me, money was never really like a, a driving factor back then. Oh, really? Um, it was never about money. Like any money I had was always like being spent on my friends. So I, after a night, I didn't really drink or, or smoke or anything. I would always be the DD. So we would pile in my dad's SUV when we'd go to like Wendy's and I was a kid picking up like the $300 tab at Wendy's because everyone's broke. No one has jobs. You know, their parents might give them like 10 bucks to go out. Um, so I was that person. When I threw a house party, I was the only one that threw a party where, you know, there was a whole display of like chips, a buffet, food, wings, hmm. uh, sodas, everything else. You went to another house party and there was nothing there. It was just like an empty space. So it was always about the experience for me. Now, you, you OK, you you serve time. So you've obviously been able to sit down and like reflect like. Do you know why this is like, why, why are you not money driven? Why is it just something that, why do you want the attention? What have you, have you reflected on all this stuff during that time? So I think, you know, in prison, um, and even in the months when I got out of prison, I didn't really learn anything. Like I had time to reflect and I needed to go to prison to definitely remove myself from the situation of running the club. Otherwise, you know, I'd still probably be doing it now. Um, but it wasn't until like months after when, you know, HBO approached me, where I really got to look at everything and, and kind of see the bigger picture. Because when I got out of prison, I was like, okay, I want to get back into the business. I want to uh, open a nightclub. I want to do this. I want to do that. And clearly you have like that same, even though I'm older, I was like 24, 25 at the time when I got out. Um, a, a person, a young adult that hadn't really learned yet, if I'm still trying to get back into the same thing. Right. Um so months later, and when I did that, like it was a 10 or 12 hour interview with HBO, that's when things kind of hit me, seeing that bigger picture. And then even more recently, diving in um, to like some of the like the causes, the root causes, you know, me being that kid in high school that wanted to be Mr. Popular. Um, a lot of what happened to me was driven by me chasing popularity. And that really relates to like what's going on now, you know, with kids and influencers driving up their social media likes and Mm -hmm. and wanting to do this and do that you know there's definitely a danger there like if when you're chasing those likes and trying to do certain things um it has consequences and you look at a story like mine um where it could have 
well, it did go very wrong all because I wanted to be that, you know, that popular so, cool kid. So that's why you were buying, uh, you know, all the lunches and dinners and spending your money. It's because you you were, you felt like you yeah. wanted to earn their their friendship or admiration. Absolutely. I wanted to be liked, you know, I, I, I was already liked at the time. I was a likable person. I was throwing the parties and stuff. So when it came down to business and I'm at a point where I'm losing money, you know, I didn't want to be that person to tell my friends, hey, I lost your money. And then it becomes, okay, I'm not going to be liked at that point. So there was a point in the documentary where you said, like, it, it, I think it was like, I needed three years to really reflect on what exactly I did. Uh, have you been able to kind of really look into that and, and look at how you view rules in general and like the whole bucking authority thing? Like, what do you think that is? Um, you know, I think it, that had to do with, it goes back to the like park uh, about, you know, them not liking me off the bat. So I, at that point, like, I'm like, okay, you don't like me. I'm not going to try to win you over. I'm just going to, you know, like screw you, whatever. Um, and there was just something I was just, I think I didn't really, I was immature. I didn't grow up. Like now if I, if I have a rule, like I follow it. it um, and there's a lot of rules like at work or anywhere in life, there's rules. And, you know, there's going to be times in life where there's rules where, you know, it's a lot a great line where you're going to follow and you're not going to follow. Um, and that's kind of like up to you as an adult to, to figure out. And that's kind of how my dad raised me. Okay. So, so yeah. you're, you're, you're planning these, uh, proms, these par- proms, you're making commission off them. Uh, obviously the owner of this place recognizes that you have a skill for getting things set up. You're learning the ropes. Now, where do you go from, from, from this position? What does that lead to? So from the dance, it went immediately into throwing these house parties at my parents' house. Um, and your parents were cool with this. They're like, yeah, go ahead, use the house. Or- <laughs> well, so what, what <laughs> happened was um, I would say, guys, there's uh, 15 to 20 people coming over. And um, they were like, okay, you know, they, they'd rather me be at the house uh, than me go somewhere else and possible drunk driving or whatever. They'd be in control. And, you know, the first couple parties, it was 15 to 20 people. But then once I had that dance and I started uh, connecting with like the upperclassmen, the seniors and and, um, juniors, and I was just a sophomore at the time, um, everyone started showing up and they're coming in carloads of people, like two, 300 kids at our house. We live on the lake (laughs) and they're bringing bottles and bottles of alcohol. Your neighbors loved you. Uh, Actually, it's a a Jewish community. So um, they all left during like the winter months um, oh. to go down south or into the city. So you it, planned it, accordingly. Yeah, so it's like okay. a summer community. So my whole street was pretty much empty. Oh. Um, and there's actually, it's funny, there's a synagogue across the street too. Um, so there was like a big parking lot and everything. Oh so God, it wow. would be like the perfect situation. Yeah, so it'd be lined up and down. Um, it's this private community that's surrounded by a lake. So that's I was, I was um, such a good question, Justin, because I was wondering like, how did cops not get called? I know on this? that's yeah. that was my concern. I was cops, like, no, we got the cops called once, and they just had turned down the music. Hmm. Um, a lot of it was, you know, I had my dad there, so my dad was like the protector. If the cops came, you know, they just wanted to see there was an adult present. So, so two, three hundred kids show up. Your parents aren't like, hey, you said there was fifteen kids. Like, what the hell's going on? Nobody said anything. <laughs> oh, they were fuming, but at that point, you know, they 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 were they were they didn't know what to do. Yeah. They're upstairs, you know, I'm bringing them like dinner upstairs, trying to accommodate them like some wine. I'm saying, guys, it's under control. Um, some of the seniors- I think I could see the root cause now. Because <laughs> I know what I would have done if my kid did that. No, I had, uh, and that's part of it. I had a, I had a lot of leeway. Um, and I know like it's, it's very, like a lot of people look at my dad. Um, they look at, you know, in the doc, they're like, well, you know, this is partially his fault. If not, And I'm like, well, you know, I developed into a good person now because of all that. So I don't know if I would necessarily go back and put the blame on him because the blame's on me. Re- mm. You know, regardless, it's all on me. Sure. E- everything that happened, that's me 100%. Well, it seems like you idolize your dad quite a bit. And he was successful in his business that he was running. And you were actually working for him uh, for quite some time and picked things up, right? Uh, and what were those things that you picked up from the way he does business? So I never really understood like, the business business aspect of it like obviously the, 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 yeah <laughs> and i really needed that like i needed an adult to to um to sit down and say listen this is how you do accounting this is how you do this this is how you deal with banks and i didn't have that but with him i learned like execution um the planning the people organizing skills, probably people skills how to run a team how to be a team leader because i was running these weddings and uh, of like 30 wait staff at, at a young age 
Um, I knew how to set things up. I, I saw. I always saw the bigger picture. So he taught me that. So when you're throwing these big parties, you're starting off. You're throwing these big house parties with kids at your high school. You're charging money for these parties. Like, how is this being organized? So the house parties, we never charged money. If anything, we would set up a bar on the patio to hide it from my parents. Because if they found out about the bar, I'd, it would be over. I'd be off to like a detention center or something. Um, but um, it would it would be five bucks a head, you know, for to drink all night, and that would cover the cost of the. Of the oh, liquor. so you're you're. Your parents, I mean, come on. They have to know you're drinking, right? They knew they were drinking. They knew kids were, you know, bringing alcohol. I don't know if they necessarily knew I was supplying it. I know my dad was furious at, like, the prom one night because the the, the prom, um, the teachers give out these, like, bottles, these clear jugs, and the kids use that to fill it with liquor. So <laughs> he was like, you know, what's the purpose of them giving these jugs out? Um but he he would always confiscate it. He was very anti liquor, oh, okay. so he would go around. He didn't want kids drinking. He knew that was a part of it, but he didn't know that we were drinking. We'd try to conceal it. We'd be going through the party saying, "Hey, don't have that bottle open," because uh, you know there's a lot of things in local towns of drunk driving, mm -hmm. um, accidents, mm -hmm. a death, and that's you know goes back to uh, when you're chasing popularity, trying to like throw one of those parties. Um, and something happens that could change your life forever. You know, if right. you're one of the kids hosting the party. Well, that's, that was another one of my questions. There wasn't any major incident that happened as a result of those house parties. Well, there was, it was me going to federal prison well, years that, later. But well, yeah. <laughs> that's what you're running. We're, your we're own getting, we're getting, to we're that. getting there. Yeah. Yeah. This is the stepping stone. But there was no, yeah. I mean, no fights, no, no, no drunk driving. Yeah. Going, no, I, was I was going to say, like, fortunate. we've had many incidences. Like I've gone to house parties and things as, you know, in high school and there was there was a major uh, disaster that happened. You know, one of our friends like crashed into a tree, killed a couple of people in the car. Like the whole community was shattered by it. But it's just it, it's amazing that you made it out of that situation at least. Yeah. Yeah. So so right now breaking even, you're not making any money. It's just you enjoy doing this, and and you're really enjoying it. You like being this person that can throw these parties. So I loved like the planning of it. I loved the build up, and um, I mean we'll talk about it with the big shows. But I I didn't like the actual party. Stressed me out. Like I I was babysitting. I never had a fun time at my parties. Um, I just liked that that build up. Everyone texting me saying, "Hey, what's up for tonight? Can I have the address? This and that." Um, so it was all about the build up and the planning, and that goes back to me learning that planning and execution from my dad's company. Uh, the actual party, I'm thinking, okay, when's the next one? Hmm. Um, and I kind of use that concept to be a successful like networker and promoter later on when I get into these teen club nights. Okay, so now, now what's the next step? So you got these house parties breaking even. What's the next progression from there? So the next step is my parents finally figure out that every time I say 20 people, it's ridiculous. There's not 20 people. Um, it got to the point where I was like bringing a, them a list of everyone's name that was invited. And then they just didn't believe it at that point. Mm -hmm. So they said, no more parties. Um, so that's when I came across the Palace Theater in Danbury. Uh, the owner of it, he owns a lot of uh, real estate downtown, and we had did the Connecticut Film Festival through my dad uh, and on Main Street at that uh, venue, and my dad was friends with the owner. So the owner says, "Yeah, you could rent it out," and uh, he charges me a thousand bucks for it. And it's this old prehistoric, you know, uh, venue uh, theater, and I turned the lobby into a nightclub for the night. And I call it the end of the year blowout. This was uh, June 2011. I just turned 16. Okay. And at this point now, you're, you're, you've are you kind of got a name for yourself in the high school. So it's not hard to get people to show up uh, for this party. Are you now, how are you turning this into a profit? Or are you still thinking? Yeah. Are you charging at this yeah, point? Or are you how thinking breaking right here? Yeah. We charged. It was uh, $12 a head. Um, I think it was like $10 at, in advance, $12 at the door. I printed flyers. Um, and I got like the logistics of, of how to market event because uh, I took that same concept of a school dance, but now this is outside the school dance, outside the school. You don't have the school to market. So it's like, okay, how do I get these kids to come without that network of being able to use like the school's PA system um, and whatnot? And there was also a real market for something outside of a school dance because kids wanted to dance, you know, uh, but the... Um, like the school would monitor, like you couldn't be within a couple feet of each other, no inappropriate dancing. Mm. Um, it was very strict. Mm. So how, how do you monetize that? How do you, you know, make it a, a thing that kids want to go to? Because they'll go to the house parties, but how do you get them to charge 
um, for it. Yeah. Hey, you can grind at this party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no rules here. Yeah. So what do you do? How do you, how do you so make out? How do you get kids to, to show up to this? So I kind of marketed it like it was a school dance without authority. Cause kids love dressing up for the dances. They love taking the photos and they hate authority. So, <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It was great. They, they, they really liked that concept. They liked, they knew I could throw a, throw a party and they liked like that club environment. So I said, I was, I branded it as a nightclub for the night. And I rented a dance floor, um, a DJ booth. We had bars, non-alcoholic. We were doing like mixed non-alcoholic drinks. We had bartenders. We had Danbury Police Department. We had like bouncers with the earpieces in and shirts that said security mm. um, and walkie-talkies. It was. It looked like a legit, like maybe a New York City or Los Angeles nightclub for these teenagers. And um, I started passing these flyers out. Facebook was just getting really big. I was going to ask you about the social media, like how you've really, you know, been able to capture that now for marketing purposes. So it was all Facebook at the time. Instagram was just beginning. Mm -hmm. um, no one really used it. I don't think Snapchat was out then. It was all Facebook and, and Twitter. Mm. Um, and Facebook events was the thing. That was the party invite. Uh, between that and my phone, of course, uh, I would send out, back then you could like hit select all on your invites for friends and I could have 5,000 invitations sent out like that and a snap of a finger and everyone would get it. And back then people were more interactive. Like if they said they were going, that would be an accurate account. Did that you they were unselect going. certain people? No, I'd invite everyone, even the haters, like the kids. <laughs> Cause there were certain, you know, kids at the high school that right. would absolutely despise the events. They despise the drinking. They right. You had to have me. had some haters along the way. Um, and you know, they're great, great marketing. Cause every person that says they don't like something that just triggers another person to look into it, to form an opinion themselves. Okay. So are you now the did first, you make you money? The did you make money? I was just going to say, cause you, you had the bouncers, you have all this stuff. Did you, were you profitable? Or yeah. You, I oh, made about 2000 cash for myself. Um, it, it was definitely profitable. Um, cause we did like over a thousand kids. So you gross, wow. you gross 12,000. Um, then you made the, the concessions. Um, so after everything was paid out and, and the, I should have made more, but my expenses were very high cause I didn't really know the workings, of everything I paid like 1500 bucks for flyers, which never should have been a thing. I ordered on one of those online printing sites <laughs> yeah. and that was just, and for like a thousand Old flyers. School. Yeah. yeah. It was like a dollar a flyer. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. So from there now, what what's next? When when does it start getting a little shady? So that night there was like a couple ambulance runs because people pregame, they come drunk. Mm. Then when they get there 10 minutes in, they're throwing up in the bathroom. You have to call the ambulance. Um, so the owner didn't really want to have that again. He didn't want that uh, with the building. And I understood that. So... Um, I reach out to this kid, Lewis, who went to my school, who, who DJed at the local clubs like downtown. That's Tuxedo Junction and this and this place called uh, Club Crystal or Club Plasma. And um, there used to be this thing called Tea Nights when I was in middle school because uh, we had DJ skate at the ice arena. And then we had Tea Nights at, at, at Tuxedos, which I never really went to. Uh, but we'd always see the flyers all around the school. like So flooded. it's mostly a 21 and over club, but then it would have this one night that's for teens. So Tuxedos was an 18 and over club. Okay. Uh, Danbury has like a, a weird law with that, with the 18 and over, 18 to party, 21 to drink. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would close the, the liquor on once a month to do these teen parties. The market then became very oversaturated. The mayor kind of banned them and mm -hmm. teen parties became mute. Um, for like that first couple of years um, between my eighth grade and, and you know, uh, going into sophomore year. It's funny. I, I remember when I was in uh, Illinois, there was a club like that that had 18 and under and it was like fenced off. Mm -hmm. But then the rest was like 21 and over and you'd end up seeing people in the 21 and over <laughs> giving <laughs> beer and alcohol yeah. to, to that group. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. That, that wasn't the case, though, with that club. Um, well, I mean, there was a ton of underage drinking, not yeah. at the teen parties. That was very strict. But at the 18 and over college nights, it was a known thing. I mean, to make money at a college night, you have to serve mm. um, illegally uh, to minors. Every college bar does it. Okay. So you move to this different uh, venue and you, you're, you're trying to set up a new party. Any changes? So I went to, first I went to Plasma and the owner looks at me and, I, you know, I'm the 16 year old and he says, absolutely not. Like we're booked for the next six months. So then I walk across the street to Al at Tuxedos. Um, and Al's great, this really old school Italian guy. 
And I'm at that point, I'm wearing like a suit and tie to work because I'm into school because I felt like I was like this business person. <laughs> nice. I, I had this charity. Of, oh I had business God. cards. It said like Ian Bick, executive director of this. And I, I called myself, this is where it's at productions to like brand it, formed an LLC. And, um, you know, I go to him in the suit and tie in a briefcase and I say, listen, I want to I want to take the place, you know, I want to run it and do events. Does I want he laugh the, a little bit? Is oh, he... he's, he's cracking up. He's not taking me seriously. <laughs> and um, I'm like, okay, I want the, the big room, which could hold like 1,500 kids. And he said, no, I'll give you the small room and it, it has to be like a weeknight. So he gives me um, this room for 750 bucks. It was called Streets and that's the front part of it. And it could hold, a uh, legal capacity was like 100, but you could really fit like two to 300. And I didn't even promote it. I just sent out uh, an invite to my friends. Uh, it was just Danbury High School kids charged like eight bucks to get in. Um, and we did like 300 people. Wow. And that was just like one night at the club. That's like a it, 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 on a, it, it on was a week great. night too. It was a summer, but oh, okay. yeah. But even still like a, someone like Al would never get that many. That was extra business for him. Right. right. Now so, did you, now what was the profit on that one? Are you starting to scale up with the business? I think I dropped this thing. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> it's fine. Did it disconnect and you still hear yourself? No, I'm good. I'm okay, good. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, so um, the profit I made, I think like five hundred to a thousand bucks, because there was no expenses with that rental fee. He paid for the security. He paid for um, essentially everything. The music was in there. So I realized a place like this could be very, very profitable. Mm. So now you're doing these in each one. You're making a profit. You're up, you're a kid, right? You're you're 16 years old or whatever. How's your ego? How big is your ego getting? Are you just getting cocky? as hell now at this point ego is through the roof man um i mean i just felt like i was like the king of danbury high school um for parties like i was running everything you know i was involved in i was vp in my class i was involved in the proms i was involved in homecoming they came to me and said can you help us reboot our homecoming dance because no one would show up it was in the cafeteria they didn't want to spend any money and i turned the cafeteria into this elaborate nightclub using like party rental companies. We put up pipe and drape, a dance floor, uh, up lighting. And it was it was a big success. They raised like $12,000 for this uh, veterans charity. And that's something, you know, that had never been done before. Now, at this point with your ego just blowing up are and looking back, are you treating people a little differently? Are you acting like your ego is real big at this point? Mm. So um, referring to back then or now? Back then. So I didn't realize it until I saw the old footage. So Mike Squires, who took all the old footage of tuxedos that you see in the documentary. And I'm like, wow, I'm an asshole. Like, I'm just looking at it like I was just, I was not like nice to people. Like I would just always, always on my phone. They'd ask me a question. I'm just like, ah, whatever. Like constantly glued to my phone. And, you know, I was always raised to be nice to everyone, treat everyone with equal respect. Um, but I just looking back on it, I think I definitely strayed from being very nice in high school to then going into a period of time where, um, you know, I was, and also I was going through a lot, not that that's an excuse, but I, I was putting on a lot of weight. I was dealing with a lot of stress. Um, but I was just not nice to people. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a real danger when a kid gains that much uh, attention because mm-hmm. you're young, you're not, you know, you're, you're. You don't have any wisdom yet, right? And so you get all this attention. This is one of the reasons why I think like child celebrities just have such a, a challenge is your ego gets so big you just don't know until much later when you're older and you look back and like, oh shit, like what was I what was I doing? <laughs> so from there that you did that, you made a little bit of a profit, ego's exploding. Where are you going from there? So from there, Al lets me book like three or four dates right in a row because at that point I understood marketing. I at each event I needed to have the next one set up. So if I did one event, I needed to have the next one ready with flyers by the end of the night to market the next one to get kids to go. Uh, So the first one, the Halloween rave, I do 750 kids and that's marketing to schools all over Connecticut and the, like Mm. the New York border. Um, They're like 10 minutes away, the local towns, and that's bringing in everyone. We're doing um, a a lot of flyers at different schools. You would get like ambassadors. Branching out even further. Yep. And people became familiar with this. This is where it's at productions name and my name. We'd have like our Twitter handles on on the flyer, uh, like at Ian underscore Bick. And um, then what happens is um, at the time, EDM electronic dance music was starting to make like a comeback or return these mashups and stuff. 
and at the high school proms and dances, it was always just one genre, like that pop music. Mm-hmm. There, there wasn't that mix. So I was the first one to bring to Danbury like that mix. You have like the reggaeton or you have this and this mashed up together with the hip hop. And it attracted all types of people, all music genres. And they loved it. The kids loved it. And we did 750 people. Then the Christmas rave, I dressed up as Santa. Um, and I, I was flinging uh, like a candy and stuff from the stage. We did a thousand people. And then we did a paint party that did 1,200, and then another one did 1,500. And it was just crazy in the amount of money I was making. I'd go to Al at the end of the night, and I'd have like $20,000 cash just sitting on the table. Um, and I was taking away like anywhere from an eight to $10,000 profit. Wow. So so now at this point, everything's legit, right? You're not you know really breaking any laws. You're not scamming anybody. You're, 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 you have a legit business. And you're making money in a legitimate way. Is this is this correct? Except for tax evasion, I was a kid that didn't know anything about tax. That's well, okay. but, but, <laughs> I mean, a full calendar year hasn't even passed though yet, so you don't even know about taxes. Yeah, yet. this yeah. is like six month period of time um, where I'm making all this money. I I buy a new car. Um, I, I really just spend the money on my friends too. Like we're all just hanging out, having a good time. Now, are you is, at this point? Is your dad like, hey, look at my kid? He's an entrepreneur. He's making good money. Are they encouraging you at this point? Uh, I don't think my mom really knew much about what money I was making. She was very out of it. Um, she didn't uh, know like what I was doing with the teen club nights or whatever. She knew I was getting local press from the charity. Uh, my dad definitely took an interest to like the club nights and stuff, but they weren't really like guiding me. I didn't go to them. I was just like, to me, like I had a business, but I didn't at the same time. There was no structure. There was no long-term thinking. To me, it was just what's the next step to getting famous or to, to building, to getting more people, you know, to like me or to be attracted to it. Mm-hmm. Had I just done those teen nights, you know, we'd probably not be having this conversation. I could have stuck with that, made good money, gotten a, like a legitimate business, and that would have been the end of it. All right. So how so how does it start to go in the wrong direction from there? I mean, you're making a lot of a lot of money for a young kid, very short period of time. You're getting the attention that you you're seeking. How does it start to go in the wrong direction? So two defining moments happen at that time. One is kids are seeing like, there's a lot of touring acts. So when when you're getting to be like that junior or senior in high school, your parents are starting to let you bring or go out to concerts and, and do things like that. So Mac Miller had came to Danbury and um, kids went and they're like, Ian, why can't you bring someone like him to to a show at Tuxedos or wherever we want to go to concerts. Kids were getting bored with the teen nights and also the market was getting oversaturated. Al was renting out the club to every kid that wanted to be like me. Um, and it was good for him because he wanted to get that rental fee, but it was bad for my business because there was no way to differentiate the two brands. Anyone could throw my name on it. There was not like, oh, I'm going to get a lawyer and sue you for using right. my brand. So that kind of deteriorated it and I was losing control over that. So with everyone saying, Ian, you should do this, there goes the popularity thing again. Uh, you know, I'm chasing that wanting to be like, let me try now to book an act. And so what do you do? How do you, how do you, who do you go after and what does that look like? So my idea was to book Big Sean and Danbury. And um, which I- Which would be huge if you did that. Which would be massive if I could pull that off. And um, this guy, Dave Osei, who graduated in 2011, a couple years older than me, uh, had went to uh, Rhode Island for college. And Rhode Island was blowing up with these big EDM shows and hip hop shows because it's a big college school, big party school. And Dave uh, had immersed himself into that whole production aspect um, with the, the college and doing these shows and frat parties. And he had got wind of what I was doing with the teen parties in Danbury. So he sets up a meeting with me and we talk and I kind of tell him my idea. Um, and at this point, we I had a couple other partners involved from other towns who didn't make it into the documentary. Uh, Josh Tupper was one of them that you see in the, in the doc. Um, and Dave actually steals my idea to bring Big Sean to Danbury. Oh. Um, he cuts me out and takes Josh and, and this kid, Zach and Matt. Oh, wow. That's not in the documentary. Oh, there's so much. That's why it's gotta be a TV series, but, mm. um, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know, let's, why we're here. Cause I had a question around Dave cause he opted not to be in the documentary. I'm assuming mm. this is why, um, Dave was a big part. Like, so as in the doc, they, and the, the government always said, okay, I took over $500,000, but their big point was the jet skis. 
So the jet skis, you know, yes, it was a bad decision, but that only amounts to $20,000. So where does all the money go? Um, most of this money, I was the middleman to bring, to investing into Dave's company. Uh, and that was with the concerts. These concerts aren't free. How do, how do I afford acts like Tyga, Big Sean, um, any act, you know, these acts are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars. Where does that money come from? Mm -hmm. So money was essentially getting, I was like the hedge fund company that would then invest into Dave's production company. And all that money just got lost. So, so let's back up, right? Because yeah. there's some steps in between that, right? So yeah. he takes your idea and he runs with it and you're like pissed. Yeah. Oh, I'm pissed. I'm like, wow, that, that's crazy. Um, I wanted to invest in it. I had money to invest, my own money from the teen nights. And they come to me like a couple days before they announce the show. And they're like, Ian, we need you to promote it. Because they never thought about how they were going to promote it and outreach it mm. in Danbury, the surrounding towns. So we worked out a deal where I could throw my name on it and say that I booked Big Sean and Danbury with having no risk to do it, which was great exposure for me. Right. Um, and I got to meet like his manager and get like that whole aspect of how a, a big tour works and really and learn about that. And they cut you in on the deal or did they pay you outright for that? I didn't get any money. It was just the exposure. Okay. So you yeah. did it for free just to get your name and get the connections or whatever. Exactly. And how does it go? Does he put this together and does it go well? He puts it together, but the show's a flop. I, uh, they only had three weeks to promote this arena size show and my network's only like 1500 people. So I get 1500 people to go, but you, we needed 2000 just to break even two or 3000 to break even the place holds 5,000. Uh, but it was big Sean and Danbury, which was great. And he, he was a, a huge act Grammy, uh, nominated. And, um, what happened was the, the video wall, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the production aspect. It's like these LED four by four things and they cost like 10 to $15,000, uh, a panel. And we looked at the artist rider the day before and it says, oh, we need this video wall. And everyone's like, well, we, we overlooked this. So we got charged like $20,000. Oh, so they expect you to, to, to have that. Yeah. It's well, not like they brought well, that this, with their this is Well, this yeah. is a common thing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like, dude, like with especially big name people, they're yeah. like, oh, it has to be a certain I just type. want to show up. has to be a certain type of piano. I want certain lighting, stuff like that. And you got to handle with that shit, right? Yeah. So like tours like Justin Bieber or whatever, they're bringing their, a lot of their own gear like, uh, and they're getting the money from the tour. But a, a, a promoter booking a one-off is responsible for all the production. Mm. We're responsible for everything, down to like sorting through their M and M's yeah. or their skills. How do you skittles. make profit in that situation? It's a like Al says, it's a very high risk business. I right. mean, you're putting up a hundred grand for a show that can make a hundred grand profit, or you could lose everything. Plus, they don't show up sometimes, right? Yeah, I, I only had that instance once with Chief Keef. Mm. Um, that had to do with us going not through an agent. When you go through the agency. Um, there's never an issue. Mm. It's when it's with the manager and you're doing shady deals to try mm. to save money. Wow. That's when, you know, there's a lot of issues. With so, that. so you didn't have to put any money into this. So you didn't really lose any money, even though it was a flop, but, nope. but now you're connected to a, a different network. Yep. Okay. So now where do you go from here? So, uh, Matt and Zach each lose like $5,000 and they come to me and they're like, Oh, let's get rid of Dave. Let's cut him out. You know, we don't need Dave. Let's go book our own show. Let's raise the money. Um, cause at that point Dave had had like these spreadsheets. So I kind of had an understanding of what the cost of a show would be. Um, the only thing we were missing is a event insurance, which I didn't come to learn about like till years later, mm. uh, which would have been helpful to know at the time. But, um, so we decide, okay, we want to bring Wiz Khalifa to Danbury. We put up a poll. Uh, it was like Wiz, ASAP Rocky, um, ASAP Ferg and, and a couple other people and everyone voted for Wiz Khalifa. So we estimated that if Wiz was like $60,000 to book, cause Matt, one of our partners said he could book Wiz. Uh, he had booked Asher Roth for us at the time. So we figured, okay, he could book Wiz. So we figured 60 grand for the act. Then with the venue, the lights, everything would be about $125,000 for the show. And, um, they look at me, okay, how are we going to get $125,000? So I start going around to my friends at the high school and I said, do you guys want to throw in money? Uh, because at the time they, they would give me like 500 or a thousand bucks to go into the teen nights mm. and I would take like some legal zoom contract and I'd give them like 2% and they would make a few hundred bucks on their money. 
Uh, that way, so two percent of what money. they gave you, or two percent of the profits. Two percent of the profits, two to five percent. Got it. Uh, of whatever, like ten thousand dollars was. So they were making a couple hundred bucks. Sure, sure. Uh, on their five hundred bucks, which Easy was money. a good return. Yep. Yeah. That way, everyone felt involved, and it also and they all played sports, whereas I didn't. So they had that network to uh, other schools mm-hmm. through sports to get these kids to come. So um, what happens is I start reaching out to kids that said, "Hey, we're booking Wiz." would you like to throw in money? And a lot of it, and I was asking for a lot of money. I was asking for a thousand to $5,000. I, I figured I needed, you know, like 20 people or whatever I needed to, to put in money. And um, a lot of them was like, okay, let me talk to my parents. Let me do this. And it was slow rolling. And we only had like, this was November at the time of, of 20, uh, 2012. And um, we only had, you know, we wanted to do the show in January. So we were, we were pressed for time. We need to get the show announced. Um, so what happens is I said, this isn't going fast enough. Let me think of another way. So I edit the contract on legal zoom and I say, I'm going to guarantee their money back. Oh, wow. So, so this is where the shit gets, uh, this is where, this is where it gets sideways. shady. Yeah. This is where it gets shady. It, it's all legitimate at this point. Um, what, and, and I'll explain, um, but the money starts flowing in. I raise one hundred twenty thousand dollars in like a week or two. Wow. Uh, well, I mean, who wouldn't, right? You, you're going to put money in. You're guaranteed to get your money back plus percentage. I mean, obviously. And, and you've paid them back before this with the their small investments. So I had paid them back with like that the little teen nights, right. and I didn't guarantee them a profit. There was no rate of return. It was it was a potential profit if the show was profitable. But you already gained trust. Yep. And um, they wanted to meet Wiz Khalifa. So that was part of the deal. They got some backstage passes. Mm -hmm. Um, So we raised the money. My aunt and uncle put in money. uh, All of our parents put in money. And then all these kids put in money, uh, ranging from $1,000 to $10,000. Wow. And what was the guaranteed return? Do you remember? It was zero. It was just uh, the profit, a potential profit. Oh, I'm talking about later. Oh, he guaranteed to get their money back and then a percentage if it was profitable. Oh, okay. So like if they put in $10,000 on a $100,000 show, they would get 10%, whatever the math is. I see. I see. So they're going to get, no matter what, they're getting their money back is basically what the contract. So you, so you put this together, you got the money, everybody's guaranteed to get their money back. What happens? Well, my logic is, you know, the, the show's going to at least break even. It's Wiz Khalifa. Sure. I got to put 2000 people in. Yeah, he's a big name. So it wasn't like a fraudulent intent. It was just like, okay, I'm going to get the money back so I could guarantee the money. We bring it to Matt and I, we needed, he said we needed proof of funds for the artist. And that was believable. You know, we were kids and they'd want a, a legit show. Sure. And uh, we give him the bank stub and Matt's like a ghost. He doesn't know what to do. And it, and it comes out that he lied and he, he didn't have the connection to book Wiz Khalifa. Oh. So it's like the week before Thanksgiving and, you know, Zach and Josh and I are like yelling at Matt. We're throwing papers around the office. The, the Matrix had given us this office. Um, in exchange for me helping out with everything. And we had this nice like office with a secretary and all this stuff. And um, we're like, what What the hell do we do? Yeah, mm-hmm. did you say, I, I just should just give everybody their money back? Or were you like, no, we're going to see what we can squeeze? Well, we are going to give everyone their money back. You gave uh, them the option. Didn't you guys all meet and then give them the option? So what happens was Matt feels bad and he reaches out to Dave Osei to try to fix it because he knew Dave got us big Sean. So Dave could probably fix this situation. Um it turns out Wiz wanted like $150,000 at the time. So we weren't going to pull it off. We weren't even close. Yeah. We weren't even close. Um, and it wasn't even feasible with the numbers. So Dave comes to us and says, listen, we've learned from our mistakes of Big Sean. We have the connections. Let's do this whole string of shows at um, at URI and in Connecticut. And, and let's break the money apart. So then I bring that idea to the investors. We have like this meeting at my parents' house in the living room. It was qu- quite a scene. We were all like huddled around. And I said, listen, you guys, totally honest up front. You guys could take your money out or you can be invested in it. And it's just going to take you longer to get your money back another six months because we're spreading the show out. Uh, about half pulled out. Some left some money in. Some took some money out. Some took all of it out. And um, we're left with like $60,000. Okay, so now what? You you got your money. Now we're gonna break up the. Sh- the you got sixty thousand dollars. Now you're gonna break up the shows. What what happens from there? So Dave books like a, a mix of like five to six shows uh, with uh, artists like Mike Studd, Huey Mack, um, a couple uh, EDM artists that weren't really well known at the time, and then um, that settled it. But then in February of 2013, he had this opportunity because we had like a buffer of twenty twenty five thousand dollars left. 
that we were just using operating expenses and anything came up. And he's, he calls me three weeks before and he says, Ian, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to do this show with Rusco. Um, it was an EDM show at URI, which had seen huge success with like these tours of life in color, day glow, the big paint parties. Um, and EDM was just a bubble that was bursting there. Thousands of kids were going. Um, I had no idea really what EDM was besides from like the mashup stuff that I was doing. And, um, we, he says this guy, Rusco, who was like a European act, uh, would be a major success. I could double the money on it. So we give him the $25,000 and this is where everything goes wrong from that point forward. So what happens? Mm. So I'm told up until the night of the show, it's making money, it's profitable because they had other partners involved too. So it's a whole cluster mess of partners. There's my investors giving to me, I'm giving to Dave, Dave's giving to someone else, all these people involved. Um, but I'm getting like these daily emails or reports of how many tickets sold, um, oh, every, this is interesting because I feel like this, the documentary doesn't kind of share it this way. There there's, I mean, there's so much to it that they couldn't really, you know, bring in. Dave wasn't really that much a big part. Of yeah. The you got to look for the audience. So they know too, cause I know a lot of people probably go watch it afterwards and there's going to be some things that don't line up. So when you go over something that doesn't line, cause I'm hearing some of the stuff and I'm going, wait a second, they really pinned all of that on you right. in the documentary. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think they really pinned it in like a negative way. I think they told like the, the, the overall of it, like, you know, this show happened and I, I'm pretty clear in the documentary. I thought it was a success. Um, but the night of I'm looking at the whole show happening and I'm like, okay, this is great. I brought my friends, the investors in a limo. We, uh, we got hotels for the night. Um, and, and it looked packed, you know, and his partner comes up to me, Dave's partner and says, wow, this was a, t a total loss. And I was like, what do you mean it's a loss? He's like, dude, we needed like 2,000 people to break even or whatever. And there was only 1,000 or 1,200 people there. Um, so it was just, that was happening. And at that point, I was already telling my investors they made money. So here comes that defining point where in my head, where am I, am I telling them they lost money mm. or am I keeping it going? Do I, do I have to lie now to cover it up um, and say that they made money when they didn't? Or do I go back and be honest with them and say, hey, guys, you lost money. But in their eyes, too, I'd, I'd think that maybe they would think that I'm lying to them about uh, losing. Oh, just wanted to keep the profits to yourself. Exactly, because mm -hmm. I'm a kid, too, and I'm thinking, okay, wow, this show looks packed. They're yeah. thinking the same thing, too. So they were all there, and they're having a great time. Exactly. So, so it, had they not been there, then maybe I would have told them. The oh, truth. interesting. That's another thing they don't really talk about in the documentary because that is right. a, that's a, a different predicament right there of going like because they're, they're probably pumped on it. Yeah, like, you oh, take yeah, them in a limo, they see all these people. Yep. Now they're like, all right, tell us how much money we made. So how do I do that? You know, how how do I then tell them you guys lost? So now mm -hmm. you're, you're still a kid. Like, how stressed out is this making you at this point? Because this is a bit of a dilemma. It's like, do I tell them? Do I lie? Then what does that look like? Like, how are you dealing with the stress of this? At that point, I wasn't totally stressed. I just made the decision to cover it up because I figured, okay, the other shows, we had like four other shows planned. I could just sacrifice my profits, mm. um, what I would make because they would do well. I figured uh, my logic was everything was always going to work out. And that got me in, into a crap load of trouble. But I always assumed there was something that was going to happen next that would work out. I was very over the top optimistic. Um, and I, I just had no understanding that things can actually go wrong. Well, in your defense, that's not that unreasonable considering yeah. how much success you kind of had up into that point. Your ego is massive because of how much success you had. Yeah. You probably think you could work your way out of this. Yeah, you're thinking you could figure out a way to make it profitable, right? Maybe the next time is going to work out. Better. But the difference was I wasn't in control. And mm -hmm. I think that's where I go wrong, too. I wasn't in control of it. Too many people involved. Too many people involved. It's, it's big leagues now. And I had no control over anything. So the first show loses. You lie to them and tell them that, hey, we're ha we're having success. Mm -hmm. Where's the where's like the number money wise? So we've got a hundred. Is there a hundred twenty grand in the pot? No, they, it 60. went down to sixty. Okay, so yep. you lose you lose sixty thousand on the first show. No, uh, the hundred twenty thousand dollars we had to give some back. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay, so it went down. That that's right. It went down to sixty because people pulled their money out. So you're working with sixty. You do that show. How much do you lose on that first show? To, so because I'm trying to do the math on how you're dipping into this sixty. I, I got back about like ten thousand oh, dollars of the so twenty five to thirty. So which was a big chunk of money we lost. Okay. And so I came up with a number that they made like, cause each, I, I looked at it to show like each person made like 500 bucks on their like a thousand or 15. Mm. So not only did I lose 
twenty thousand dollars of say that thirty k investment, but then I was also in the hole of that imaginary profit of so, what you're telling them they're making. So too. figure another yeah. five grand. So oh, this has got to be what really fucks you yes. too, right? Because you document all this yep. and you create these fake spreadsheets to show people that they made money. Well, yeah, I sent them that. Um, the the electronic aspect that's where like the real fraud stuff is. The concerts were very legitimate. You know the way I went about things weren't legitimate but the concert if you gave money for a concert we got the show there was never it wasn't like fire fest where the show didn't happen yeah. mm. this was you know i was a legitimate promoter the shows happened um it's just the way i went about business was not ethical and then the electronics business with this was was the fraudulent part of it okay so you're taking the leftover right. money and you're you gonna get into and that. you're putting it into the next party or are you trying to get more money because you need more than that little bit that's left for the so, next one? so at that point all the parties were funded like that 60 grand okay. got paid for all at once minus maybe like last minute expenses or the other half of the artist's event so that 10 grand that came back to me went right to pay out dividends or whatever uh, I would start stalling at that point. Because ten grand wouldn't cover everyone's investors money on the thirty, um, so I, you know, I'd stall. I'd say money was taking longer to get checks in, which part of it was true because I didn't get that ten grand for like a month and a half uh, until after the show. It was always something with money, you know. Every, when when it was time to pay, it would take months and months. Oh, people and, are going to drag their feet. Now you're yeah. not you're not sweating at this point. At this point, you're like, all right, the next one's going to crush. All right, the next one's going. When did you start sweating? After the last one. Okay. When you, when that was it, you were done. <laughs> when, that, when, when I was done, that's oh, when. Oh, no, it's not working. Yeah. Oh, so the whole time you're optimistic about this. You, you The whole time you think you're going to pull yourself out. Yep, yeah. So, so what's show number two? What goes down on show number two? So, okay, that one, you're fucked. You're telling people, don't worry, I'll get your money. I'll get your money. You're probably just itching to get to the next show to get your mm -hmm. opportunity. What happens? Show number two um, was a snowstorm with Huey Mac, so that just got canceled. Um, but we had paid him in full. Be out of good faith, we we're these new guys in the industry, so we paid them in full. <laughs> How much paid was the that? club in for the show was ten grand. Ten grand. I didn't get a single dollar back. Damn. I think he still owes us a show, maybe to this day. I don't even know, <laughs> but it was like a nine or ten grand show, not a single dollar. So bam, another ten just wiped. We paid for all the hotels. I transferred like one of the flights. I went to Florida for the weekend mm. uh, with a couple friends, but. That that was it. Now, none of the investors are going, uh, this show totally got canceled. We lost money. What the hell? So at the time, I was being told that we would at least get a make update. And then we would get that the venue would let us. Because uh, the, the venue, you know, they want to keep their revenue. They don't want to give the money back. They'll say you can have a new date. Only that never happened. We never got the artist date. We never got uh, rescheduled nothing. Wow. Mm -hmm. So now the third, now you're into the third one. What, yep. What's happening there? So the third one, um, that was Crisley at, at the same club that Huey Mack was supposed to be at. And it was just poorly promoted. Like we paid five grand for this act or six grand, um, uh, plus the venue plus everything it was like 10 grand on a college night. Kids weren't spending, you know, 20 bucks when they could go to that night anyway. So we were just giving out free tickets at that point just to pack it. Oh. Um, we th They thought it was, th they figured, okay, the college night does a thousand people every Thursday. We could do a thousand. Yeah, they're doing a thousand people at a dollar entry. No one, these college kids don't want to pay $20 to get in. So just total wipe loss. I think I got a couple grand back on our investment okay now we'll get into the last show what's happening there so now you're like screw well there's screw, stuff screw. now there's stuff that happens when, at what point does the the headphones get involved here oh further later oh on. that's later okay yep. all right so keep walking us through here so, so now, much to the story it's i know i know crazy. there is i know um so there was actually two more shows one was in connecticut which i had control over of um that and i, I marketed and everything was at toad's place which is a historic rock venue in connecticut and um that lost two thousand dollars it came close to breaking even that was our best ran one um but i had no network with college kids you know social media still wasn't really this huge thing there was no facebook ads there was no instagram ads there was no way to network and i wasn't really drive i was lazy at that mm. point i wasn't that same hustler that was on the did campus. you look for anybody to partner with or anything that had connections like that i was banking on dave mm. and dave's company he was mm. the partner he was getting half of our share so it out of 100%, the investors had 50. We had 25. Dave had 25. Mm. And, you know, we figured, okay, Dave would market it. He had that college connections. He was the older person. I'm still in high school. I don't have access to these college kids at New Haven or Yale or, or any of these uh, areas. And, um, I mean, we did all right because of the artist. The artist heavily promoted it, um, which isn't the case with every artist. You have to really reach out and pull teeth to get 
artist promotions. Yeah. And um, it, we lost two grand on that. So I got, I was able to get that show cost 12 and I was able to get the, the, the money back on that too. So that's the last mm. one. No, there was one more one that more. we put up a little bit of separate money for. Um, we put 10 grand into this foam show at uh, UMass Amherst in Massachusetts and the guys scammed us. They, they did the show. It looked good. Our partner, Zach, went, looked absolutely packed. Um, and then they give us this bullshit um, PNL report like that didn't even make any sense, like inflating all the operating expenses mm. and everything and saying mm. they had less people when we could clearly tell there was more people than that. And, Do you think um, they're doing this because you're kids? Do you think they're like, ah, we- Well, they were kids too. I think they made a lot of money in that sense and they didn't want to give us our share. Mm. Um, so we lost another 10 grand there. We tried to sue them. It costed more money. We spent five grand on a lawyer and still didn't get anything back. So this is the fourth one. Now yeah. you're you're fucked. Right. We're done. That, okay. That's it. That's so all the shows. So what do you do from here now? You're like, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, now at this point, you've completely used all the money that you had that people had given you. So you yeah. you've wiped out the sixty grand and you've done all these shows. You're not now. You're probably scrambling to figure out how am I going to get some of this money. Back. I'm in the hole like thirty grand. I think the numbers come out too. Like okay. with uh, with getting money back from shows and oh, and then right. everything. Because you do still get some of the money back on those other shows mm-hmm. that we did get back. Um, so I'm in about 30 or 40 grand. And so then I start going to like shady people to just for loans. Um, a couple of guys I worked with at the matrix, I said, do you have it? I knew that like he dealt weed. So I was like, do you know anyone that can, you know, loan me money? Cause now I'm just thinking, okay, how do I make these oh, payments? No. <laughs> so he links me up with these guys in New York and they're oh giving, God. they're giving me like 5,000 Bro, cash. Not, at one point you're not scared to death to even you, think about you didn't doing talk that? to your dad before I, I, this? I, I, I should, one, I should have went to my dad. I didn't, I had no concept of how much money he made at the time. Right. Um, so it wasn't even a thought I, to me. I'd be like a screw up if I went to my dad saying I needed money. So I could have, right. <laughs> right. had yeah. I went to my dad, we could have fixed everything. If I went to him, and I, I think this I goes see. back yeah. to my ego too, about wanting to do it on my own, because mm-hmm. that would have been an easy fix, just to, to, to fix, you know, he could have got involved with the parents. Yeah. We could have just taught came, you some things. Yeah, yeah. we could have came clean and said, listen, the show's actually lost money. Here's all the proof. It, it, you know, we'll give you this money back. This is what it is. Maybe it's a civil suit because he guaranteed you the money back. But there was no collateral. It was an uncollateral, you yeah. know, investment. So this is what it is. But I didn't do that. And um, I, I borrow from these shady people like five, ten grand just to stop the bleeding. Oh, people man. are blowing up my phone. I, I'm what am I? I'm seventeen at the time. Mm-hmm. What kind of drug dealer gives you five to ten grand? <laughs> and, and and what do they say that you know, hey? Uh, what are the interest rates like? How are you going to pay? Right. Like, if you don't pay this back, what are they going to do? Break your fingers? Like what's the deal? No, these are these are just like Hold some jet skis hostage. These weren't like I didn't have the jet skis yeah, yet, but <laughs> uh, yet. no, okay. these weren't like that that type of drug dealer. These are like stoners that you know okay. made some money uh, selling weed, and they weren't like a threat. So I didn't really look at it as a threat. Mm. Um, I, I promised them like a one person. I promised a uh, a piece of like that May foam show, um, which didn't end up happening. Which which screwed me too. Um, that was a one in UMass, but the um, I'm just taking this money and just to stop the bleeding. I was tired. My phone was blowing up. Everyone's like, because it's May now. They gave mm-hmm. their money in November. All the shows happened. Where's the money? Where is it? And I said everyone was successful. Mm. So now I'm, at, you know, I'm, at, I have a real situation on my hand. So you're taking right. loans to pay people back is what you're doing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Ponzi now, scheme. Now how you feel like, able to do that? Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, with the with the drug dealers, um, I was. It's not like I went to them and said, "Hey, you're going to invest in this," and then I took your money and paid off someone else. I just said, "Hey, I need a loan. It's a personal loan. Sure. I could I could pay you off with a personal loan." Mm-hmm. If I went to a bank and said I need money to pay off a credit card, I could do that. Right. Now, are you okay. stressing? Yeah. Are you at this point? You shit in your pants? Or I, I was stressed. Yeah, I was under a lot of pressure because I worked with people. I went to school with them. Um, you know, so I'm just delaying, you know, I'm stalling. I'm saying there's problems with the bank. There's problems with getting the money, this and that. But it was a very, very stressful time that like April, May of 2013. Now I'm assuming though, at, still at this point though, you don't even probably know what a Ponzi scheme is or know what you're doing is illegal yet. Do you, or you just think you're just doing whatever it takes to get back? Or do you know? I didn't know what a Ponzi scheme was until I went to that reverse proffer with the federal government. We were never taught about Bernie Madoff. That was still too recent. There was no Bernie Madoff. There was nothing. The first time I heard the name Bernie Madoff was months after, and someone said, oh, as a joke, you're the next Bernie Madoff. And I was like, "What? who's Bernie Madoff? Then I start Googling it, 
And I'm like, oh shit, this could kind of be compared to what I was doing essentially, but it wasn't, there was no intent of, okay, I'm going to set up this Ponzi scheme, steal from everyone, do this, do that. And, and you know, it's, a, it, it's this you're big You're just trying thing. to patch holes. At this it, point. it was just stop the bleeding, put a yeah. band aid so on. So you're digging a hole for yourself. Uh, how do you, what do you do next that makes the hole even deeper? Because you're, you're taking loans, paying people back, but it doesn't stop there, right? So my friend introduces me to this guy named Henry Scazafava, and he had just got this big settlement um, from a gym because he had lost vision in his eye from um, uh, equipment uh, malfunctioning and breaking. So he gets like a million bucks. And um, this kid Ryan introduces me to him and brings me to him. And I'm sitting in their basement and I'm telling him, at this point, this is when we're starting to get into electronics. I meet this kid, John Roble. Um, we're biz- we become business partners and he brings me the these like Beats by Dre and says, listen, I can get these for 50 bucks and we could sell them for 400 bucks. Now, you know, if I brought that to you, you're going to, you know, as adults, you're going to say, well, why is it only 50 bucks? Right. Mm-hmm. To me, I kind of asked it. I said, well, where do they come from? And they said, it's off the truck product. <laughs> like it, like it, truck. it fell off the truck. <laughs> like it's from China. It fell off. It fell off the truck and um, oh. it's dented, damaged goods. Sure. I didn't really know much about like fake. I didn't use beats. I didn't, I wasn't into that. I wasn't into flashy clothes. I, I wore the same thing all the time. It wasn't anything fancy. You know, I had a cheap suit and tie um, that I was wearing around and, and that was it. It wasn't about clothes. And um, so we get these electronics and that's when I start this. It's called WB and Wholesale. LLC for Robo and Bic. Wait a second. So you actually start an LLC to sell fucking illegal uh, beats by Dre? Didn't think they were illegal at the time, but yes, we're selling these beats. We're selling <laughs> OtterBox phone cases, which look very real. We're now, selling I feel DVDs. Like, I feel like your lawyer should have been able to use that to your advantage, though, to show just how naive you were in the situation versus the intent. Because I'm sure the, the FBI is trying to paint you as this guy who is this master like a mastermind. Yeah, yeah, mastermind. But if you know it's illegal and you know you're doing some shady shit, that's as dumb as a drug dealer selling dope and keeping spreadsheets on his dope that he's selling. Like, this doesn't make sense. And, you know, here's the thing. We went to a lawyer who drafted those contracts, these loan agreements with the rate of return. And he said, yeah, this is totally legit as long as you're waiving the right to usury, like the usurious rates of the interest because hmm. that you, what, you can't go above 20% or whatever it was. And um, he is the one that structured. I went to him and I said, listen, I want to give a 50% rate of return. And the only thing he asks is well, where the profits come from. And I said, well, I get that 50% number, not because I'm trying to you know, get people to give their money, but because I'm looking at the potential profits from these electronics, that's where that figure comes from. Uh, It wasn't to loop people in. It was because if we can make a hundred or 200% return on on electronics, we can give, we can afford to give 50%. Of course. If you're buying headphones for 50 and selling for 400, there's no reason we can't give you 50% of that. So you were getting investors to invest in this business as well? Yeah. At that point, the concert business was on hold. Um, I'm just trying to get out of it. And I'm starting WB Wholesale and I'm going to like people at the Matrix that didn't invest in concerts to give five or 10 grand. I'm giving that to my partner, John, and we're making some money. It's it's legit at that point. Um, we could pay out that 50% rate. It was legit for about a month or well, two. Well, it's kind of legit. <laughs> yeah, uh, besides the fact that they were fake, but we did get a lawyer to draft a contract with this guy, John. Right, yeah, at was, this point, well, you think it's yeah. completely legit. Where were you yeah. selling these beats by Dre? Um, so John had this other guy from Bethel yeah. who I eventually meet him and he pulls up to the meeting in a Burberry suit driving a golf cart. So imagine this kid who's like <laughs> our age coming to a meeting. Just has him like yeah, just and, in his back. And yeah. he's, he sits at these restaurants racking up tabs all day. Like we'd get in, we'd offer to pay and the owner was like, you don't want to pay. It's at a thousand bucks already. Mm. Just like drinking wine and he ends up getting charged for fraud later on separate from mine. All right. Um, so it's just like a whole mess of kids with all this money doing all this. Mm. Um, but we we draft a contract with him saying the product's 100% legit. He's getting it from a legitimate source because that was one of my concerns. Um, it soon comes to find out, you know, like the beats weren't registering on their website. They were falling apart. Like you'd be listening at like the, right. the ear thing or, or the yeah, cord would just kind of brought off. that up. That way. He yeah. was concerned and he brought that to you and, and said I you, you weren't very concerned about yeah, it. Yeah, I figured I was good because the con- to me, a contract was everything. Mm. Like I looked at if you sign the contract, um, 
you know, we were good. But what I'd learned later on, you know, the contract's only really as good as the person mm. signing the contract too mm-hmm. and putting their word behind it. Because if it's not guaranteed with some type so of So you didn't think you were liable? No, I didn't think I was liable. I thought it was good if there was an issue with fake product. Mm. Mm. So you're getting money from people to, to buy these electronics, to sell them. You're offering them a profit. Now that, what happens there? That goes belly up and you still owe me, now you owe people money again? So the contracts started helping me, um, the, the, um, the, electronics helped me bury out of like that 30, 40 grand hole I'm in paying back the drug dealers from this first initial round of concerts. And um, then I meet Henry and I'm just trying to clear everything up. And I say, Henry, I need a loan for $30,000. That's a figure, pay everything off, get a clean slate. And he wasn't interested about where the money was going, what it was doing. He was had invested into Henry, I mean, to this kid, Alex, who we were getting electronics at the time. And he just said, well, what's your interest rate? And I said, uh, you know, I'll give you 50%. And he said, that's not enough. So he charged me on 30 grand. He wanted 50 grand back. Wow. <laughs> so. And you said, okay. <laughs> yeah, I had I had three weeks to give him 50 grand back on, on, on his 30K. So it was 50 grand total. And at that point, I, one, where else was yeah, I going to get the gonna money? You're going to take what you can get. I'm going to take what I could get. I'll figure it out because that was my mentality, you know? <laughs> figure it out later, do it now, I'll figure it out, maybe whatever it was, you know? So I consolidated all the debt and I took his money, paid everyone off and I had a fresh start. Except you owe him now 50 grand. Yeah. Owed him 50 grand, yes. So how? what was your plan on, how are you going to get him his money back now? So the plan was I was going to keep the electronics business going and, and, you know, really get another investor because everyone would have been paid back, go deep in the electronics Dave gets wind of the electronics business and um, and URI, and he feels bad about this string of concerts. So he starts bringing me his fraternity brothers and their parents who are investing like 20, 30, 40, 50 grand. Oh, wow. um, and wow. we still have this 50% rate of return and I'm giving him a cut of like every investor he brings. Wow. So now at this point, you're generating some serious uh, money. So like that Fresh month of, meat. Yeah. That month of June, we bring in like $100,000 in like investors. And I'm, I'm like, John, you know, we could do the electronics, but the electronics never took off. And, you know, they were, we could do it small scale, a couple of grand, but you couldn't do it. One, you couldn't do it in the 21 days I was promising people, you know, their money. Had I said, okay, six months. Um, but then the, at the same time, that was me setting that days to, you know, it kind of entice people to give their money. Yeah. But, I mean, that sounds amazing. Give you, uh, you know, 50, I get 50%, I get my money back guaranteed plus yeah. 50% in 21 and in days. 21 days. And, Is that like one of the best invest? But you know what, too? Who are these adults yeah. that are not really skeptical of that? I mean, that is crazy. I think they looked at my early success with the concerts, um, you know, uh, what I was doing. And, and the, everyone thought these other concerts were successful. So, you know. You, you were actually getting things printed about you in the newspaper too, right? Th- there was press um, and people just knew like of me and they, they figured my dad was successful. So maybe he would be back. Plus it. they signed a contract and they're like, it's legal. It's yeah. all here. Yeah, so we'll if just I, take him to court. Exactly. Otherwise. So I'll just take him to court. I mean, some people brought the contract to their attorneys and these are all local attorneys. They're not dealing with anything this scale, you know, had they brought it to a, a, like a real big law firm, they'd say, what the hell are you guys doing? Um, so that was kind of like the basis of, of where this starts. So you get a hundred thousand in June. Um, I know it keeps going. So what happens next? So I mean, then Henry invests a quarter million in early July because um, Dave comes to me and says, "Ian, I was never going to take uh, Henry's quarter million. We didn't need it. Everything was good. Like we were at even with everyone. Like right at this point, I, I was still Henry. I was still investing in like the electronics on the side, which was." Kind of not kicking off and kind of turning into like that Ponzi scheme aspect, just floating it, but it still could have been a manageable, you know, problem to solve. It was when Dave comes to me and says, Ian, you know, we screwed up this last batch. Let's do concerts in the fall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's me. I have no interest in electronics. I hated the electronics. It wasn't my passion. You know, my passion was throwing events. And Dave brings me this whole... So you just light up, right? Because of the opportunities there now. Yeah. Dave brings me this presentation and it's all these acts. It's two big Tyga shows. Um, it's uh, the Chief Keef show. It's three Kid Ink shows. It's Wale. All these big acts. Massive. Massive. Like if this was successful, the gross was like $700,000 on, on like a 250K investment. 
And I was so naive thinking every single show would sell out. Mm. Um, and so I'm like, Dave, you know what? Well, we just lost. But at the same time, I was listening to like all these motivational stuff, very into like motivation, inspirational stuff. Yeah, don't give up. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> Ex- exactly. You gotta believe in Keep yourself. Keep the dream alive. No, exactly. Like you ask any of my friends, they'd say, oh, Ian was a kid posting quotes on Instagram every day. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I figured, okay, everyone like failed to get where they were. You know, I was trying to be like that next Mark Zuckerberg right. or, or That's like whoever. every entrepreneur's story. Yeah, everyone failed. And I, I would Google like, do you have to fail to succeed? This and that. So I said, okay, I'm going to give Dave a chance. I bring Henry, uh, his friend Elliot, uh, me, Zach, uh, Josh, and Dave to this meeting at the Matrix. We get the conference room, have a whole spread, like this big executive boardroom, and we're looking at this presentation for shows. And Henry wanted to do concerts, so that kind of you know, pieced together getting these ideas to do it. And I figured I could get back into what I like doing. We have this big investor. And I could have done a million other things with this money. Like I could have gotten into real estate, could have got, I could have even bought tuxedos and it would have been super successful. We could have did it locally, but instead I go into the most high risk business right. ever and, and, and you Take know, roll shot. the dice. Yeah. And, and but, we but did. you loved it. That's what your yeah, passion is. I, I loved it, man. Yeah. I was just driving for it. I believed in it. But at the same time, I was super, super lazy because my ego was so big that I had already made it. I had the office, I had the car, you know, we had the bank accounts, we had the business cards and um, I trusted, you know, other people to do it. And that, that blames on me. It's not like I could sit here and say, oh, well, he lost all the money. It's his fault. It still started with me. So it ends with me. Mm. Okay. So these shows now, do they not happen? So the shows are super successful on paper, like actually legitimately making money. Like we're seeing the Ticketmaster reports. We're seeing the venue reports. Like I said, Dave, you got to be clear with me from the start because I knew what happened the first time. So these show, like Chief Keefe was going to double our money on a 30 grand investment. It was grossing like 70 or 80K. And um, what happens is it's like a series of unfortunate events after each one. Uh, the Kid Ink shows, um, the one in Connecticut was a bomb because of lack of promotion, but we didn't, that was just a plus one. It was basically like a freebie. So that was like a one off. Um, but the one in URI, URI, so basically rap, like up and coming rappers want to pay you to get on their stage, kind of like a sponsor for your podcast mm-hmm. or whatever they pay you to get out there. Mm-hmm. So they would pay like $5,000, you know, to, to go and perform and be an opener for Kid Inc. They all perform and we're like, Dave, where's the money? Someone forgot to collect the money from oh all these people because oh. they don't pay you until the, the day of the show. Oh, so they got on stage and these are all like drug dealing type like people, <laughs> no good ethics or anything. And right. because they're just trying to get their rap career off and they, um, they leave. They didn't pay. No one collected it because it, it was looking good. We were going to be super profitable. We were going to make like 20 grand that night. A profit on top of getting our money back. Mm. And it was just a complete, didn't you know. Didn't have the systems there to grab yeah, that money first. Systems didn't happen. And then the venue bounces the check on our, our ticketing money because the venues hold the money. So that took like four or five months to get back. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they, ba- they bounced a check of money we had in their ticketing Oh, my site. God. So, so that technically was like you quarantine. could have pulled it off if some of these things didn't occur. Huh? Oh, that one would have been, that would have literally eliminated all the debt that was incurring from like these, um, these um, uh, like WB wholesale money, like that aspect of it. And at this point, I transitioned to calling it WB investments because I wanted to be like this hedge fund that was doing multiple things. A big thing that was left out in the documentary was I took o- tuxedos had closed and I took over their front room and invested a hundred grand into calling it Sky Bar, and uh, uh, it was an eighteen and older, twenty one to drink event or a club, and it was like the first luxury nightclub. It was really beautiful, like nice deck and everything. It just wasn't meant for downtown Danbury. Um, the marketing was there and everything. It could just never turn a profit got taken advantage of from the contractors, uh, everything. And, you know, Al was like, oh, you know, you don't need to put this money in. And I was just stubborn because I was like, Al, you know, we got to make the place look nice. And he was like, okay, you know, do what you got to do. He was the one on the liquor license, this and that. That was kind of our arrangement. He was the consultant. Um, but, you know, you, you really don't need to renovate. I said, Al, I'm trying to go for a new image. And I just, $100,000 on this. Ugh. taking it. The painter charged me like mm. six grand 
to paint this little room. It was it was ridiculous. Now looking back, be very be honest, okay. Looking back, do you think to yourself, oh man, it would have worked if it just wasn't for those people that didn't pay me to act to do the act, or if, if it would have worked if these people didn't rip me off, or or do you look back and say, man, I'm I'm responsible for all those actions, and I, I should have just stopped. I think when you look at the the whole story and, and you and you hear everything, I think there's multiple people that you know are involved and, and contribute to it. But overall, it's on me because I was the one that you know put it together. I was the one that sh- really should have been out there promoting certain events too. I, I had this thing in my mind that I was already successful. I had this image of success, but I wasn't successful really. I, it was just this image, everyone commenting on my social media saying you know, you're going to grow up to be a millionaire, you're you're going to be famous one day or this and that. So I, that was driving it. But yet to answer your question, it was on me. I know it was my fault. I mean, I think about what I could have done differently to kind of like change certain things. A big thing is had I, you know, taken that money at one point, I had 600K in the bank. So sure. why didn't I go to the bank and say, hey, I, I want a credit line on this money or whatever, you know, could, could, could I do yeah. anything to, to do this? Should I have went into real estate? What, what, what could I have done differently? Well, it seems like, uh, I mean, you weren't as frivolous with when you had the money, except for the one that they showed in the documentary when, you know, you kind of went, what was it to LA with your friend? And then you guys, you know, started to really spend the money because he just got acquired that million dollar uh, amount, right? And then you, you bought the jet ski. Tell us about the jet ski part. So out of all in all, I, I probably took in like 700K or 800K of investments. Um, probably like a hundred thousand of it was like misappropriated to like personal stuff. Hmm. And in my mind, I was looking at, okay, we were paying our own salaries that we would make up on these concerts down the road. Um, (laughs) I was looking at, okay, that's how I would get paid. And I would just take it out of the concert profit, like counting my chickens before they are the eggs before they hatched. Mm -hmm. So, um, we go on these trips. I figured there, it could be written off. Like, cause I would always hear my dad talking about write-offs and stuff. Yeah. Uh, with his business, but I never, uh, I know it's funny, um, but uh, I never really asked or anything. I had no sense, like there was no accounting. I didn't have books set up. There was nothing. It was just money in, money out. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until later where I tried to like do the books and get it done. Um, so we take these trips, go on investor trips. Every dinner I'm looking at as a write-off for investor meeting, we'd go out to Hibachi. It's like a thousand dollars. I'm picking up every tab. Um, we, we go and buy clothes and I realized that wasn't really for me. So John got to keep them all. It was just like open spending all on the company debit cards. And so we're in Florida and I ride jet skis for the first time. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is awesome. Like I love jet skis. And so I call the guy from Danbury Power Sports because I'd gotten a motorcycle from him a couple months prior. I said, listen, dude, uh, have two jet skis waiting for me tomorrow to pick up. And he's like, well, what are you looking at for price? And there's cocky Ian saying, I don't care about the price. Just have them. And I get ripped off so bad. I get like these two basic wave runners, like no modifications on it, <laughs> nothing for like $23,000. They're like, wow. oh, we'll throw in the trailer too. Now you could get two basic ones for like five or six grand each. <laughs> <laughs> and they're charging me $23,000 oh. for these jet skis. Oh, oh my God. I know. And I was just... I was I went and got a bank check. Had I paid in cash, it would have been different. Yeah. But it's clearly on you know the bank account that money and and the a uh, government size because they're very like analytical. You know they're looking at money's coming in uh, and then going out to this person. So there's that Ponzi scheme. But in my eyes, it's a totally different version. You know this could have been like if money was coming in for this person, then that yeah. money went to a, a concert or whatever. It was just so confusing. Um, to, to really look at. So that's got to be one of, of the few things that started to kind of raise some red flags for the investors involved. Like they saw, uh, you, you know, like the, the concerns with the electronics, with the headphones, and then now they see like jet ski purchases. Like what were some other things uh, where that got their cackles up that they brought to your attention? Actually, that didn't raise any concerns with them. They loved it. They really? kept throwing me more money. They, I'd say, hey, and this worked to my benefit. They would say, um, uh, leave your money, uh, leave, don't give me my return. Here's five more thousand dollars. 
they would just add money into it. <laughs> wow. Um, I, want, I want your friends. <laughs> That's what I want. So they, they would just, you know, they would add money into it. They would do a lot of different uh, things. And um, Well, the reason why it worked is because there's been a couple times already where he's paid them back, right? right. So you've had yep. a couple times where they've gotten it back. So like, okay, you do that two or three well, times. You're doing well now. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're starting yeah. to feel confident yeah. and they've seen the lifestyle. Yeah, when does living. it start to unravel? What, you know, when does, when does this shit starts to hit the fan? So the fall is when, I, I, during the summer, I'm just paying everyone's payments with other people's money. That's like that Ponzi scheme aspect of it. But in my eyes, I'm looking, okay, one loan to pay another loan because it's structured as a loan in the contract saying uh, they're giving the money as a loan and can use it for any you know business expense. So mm -hmm. I'm, loan payoff to me was a business expense at the time. Um, so then in the fall, when all the concerts are bombing, there's no money coming in from that. Concert business is, uh, is shot. Electronic business is folded. And the club, which I put a hundred grand into, which there was me thinking, okay, I was going to bring in 10 grand a month from that was dead too. So I have zero income um, coming in. I had also invested in like a, a kid's shoe startup company and a website and this and that. And there was just, there was zero money coming in and all these payments were becoming due. Everyone was coming home for the holidays. Everyone's wanting their money. A big part that was left out of the documentary too was the gambling aspect was a big gambler, went to Empire, and that was ultimately my downfall, which is why my bond got revoked in the end. Uh. But I would go to Empire City in Yonkers because the, the one in Connecticut was 21 and over, and I'd went to the one in, um, in, in New York, and I would turn $500 into $20,000 at the Baccarat table. So, And that goes to pay off like when I get into tuxedos, I'm paying off oh artists. God. Like I would roll the dice. And I would you're gambling wow. for like okay. the chain smokers. I owed yeah. them like 25 grand for three months because you know I figured I'd have the money. It was just like a whole mess. Wow. And um, why did they leave that I in know, the documentary? That's, that's, that's interesting. Like, that's a Th that's there's a just so much that, that there's like, too much. They're like we only have an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did so much shit. We just got to pick the craziest yeah. stuff. I thought they did a great job telling the story. They were the first ones to really you know piece the story together. Uh, whereas like the news times or local news never really was able to tell the whole story. And the feedback I've gotten from the doc is just amazing, like outpouring support for the doc. Yeah. Now, okay. So when does the law get involved? How, when, when do you get a phone right. call? Like, Hey, we're, uh, so we're calling you in. Even though I was in that much debt by the end of 2013, like at that point or about f that $500,000 in the hole, but on paper it's over a million, like with the interest rates and everything. And, um, this is another big move that I messed up on. I could have went to my dad and said, dad, this is a situation. Instead, I go to the shady lawyer in Danbury, like this ambulance chaser who was friends with my dad that had offered like for the club, uh, his full legal back. And he said, Oh, Ian's got my full support. Cause he, he was good friends with my dad. He's got a million dollar law firm backing him. So instead of telling the truth to my dad, I tell the truth to Alan um, and we sit down, I show him all the reports cause I kept a detailed spreadsheet of like every money person that was owed money. And I said, Alan, this is the deal. Cause at that point I was getting into hot water with drug dealers and, and shady people. And, um, I said, Alan, here's the deal. This is what we're out. And his advice is okay. He handles it in like a, a lawyer way. He sends letters out to everyone saying we're taking over this case. Um, the company's folding, they're bankrupt. And we're going to get back to you. So, you know, if you're a kid that thinks he's owed like $15,000 with the interest and you're getting a letter from a lawyer, you know, red flags start to go up. They're, they're like, they're blowing up my phone. I'm not answering. Mm -hmm. Terrible communication skills on my part. Not reaching out. I turn off my phone. I'm dodging everyone. Alan reviews everything, then sends another letter to everyone saying to some people who had technically made money but think they're owed money. Um, that you're not getting any money back because if they had gotten those like payments, interest payments, and it came out to more than they had put in, um, or there were some people that thought they were owed a hundred thousand, he's saying you're only owed like twenty six thousand because everyone was upset about that interest number. Mm. So they are figuring, well, you know, I own the club and the concerts. They're Ian screwing us out of all the money. Henry said every concert happened. Where's the money from it? So people start going to the local cops. Henry went first. A couple other kids started with the kids. The parents never went to the cops first. Oh, interesting. Um, had I, you know, talked to the parents, sat down with my dad, a lawyer, talked to them face to face, but I just didn't have the confidence or the guts to, you know, like tell them how it was. Um, we could have avoided a lot, but instead, 
Allen's taking the lead on it. Kids are going to the cops. The cops are, their eyes are shooting up because if they figure, okay, there's one kid that's out $250,000, there must be a hundred others and this Mm -hmm. must be in the millions. And it starts there. This is January of 2014. Um, and, and, and it increases, it gets to the federal level, uh, because the state prosecution had turned it down. They didn't really, they, they looked at it as like a civil case. Um, and then the feds grabbed it and the, and they really went very gun ho about it. Well, yeah, they kind of made an example of you. At, at what point were you, did you realize you could go to jail? Cause I, I'm assuming at this point you think worst case scenario, people are going to be pissed off. You have to pay a bunch of people. I got to pay people back. My dad's going to be angry. At what point were you like? Oh shit, I could go to jail. So even on the like the day I went like and got questioned by postal inspectors who I had no idea who they that we even had postal inspectors. <laughs> um it wasn't up until the day I actually went to jail that I thought I was going to go to jail. Like even throughout oh, trial, wow. I thought I was going to lo- uh, win at trial and we did win some counts. You're but dangerously optimistic, you know that. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, it's not <laughs> See, I have like a lot of ambition, a lot of drive, which is why I excel at Whole Foods cuz I can see the bigger picture and drive like in, I, I know what the end goal is. So when I have like guided or, or like if I had someone guiding all my ambition back then, I think it would have came out a lot different. Um, but it wasn't guided and it, and it, it was, uh, it was just letting me run rampant to do whatever. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you. You know, I, I'm obviously a lot older than you. I see a lot of tremendous potential and talent, uh, but it just, it's, it's like you went totally just misguided. L- yeah, yeah, totally the, the wrong way. Are you, now that you've, you've paid your dues, you're, you're out, obviously. Um, are you, are you, how, are you thinking that way? Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move this in the right direction. Be honest. Cause you know, I, I think I could do things. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of really like, I'm analyzing everything. So after the doc, of a ton of people have reached out, a lot of positive support from people all over the country. Uh, a lot of job offers for like sales, which in itself, like you see all like the, the stock thing. Listen, anyone that has on their bio, they're making six figures is not making six figures, like six figure earner. Um, so I got a lot of those reaching out and that goes back to like me seeing a similar situation of, of me and them um, from when I went through all that. Now I'm kind of just, you know, I'm waiting for the right opportunity. I, I really love working for Whole Foods. I'm growing with it. Um, it's, a, it's a really good job. Uh, Al, what, do you, what do you do with them? So right now I'm an assistant manager, getting ready to go for manager okay. uh, of prepared foods. Um, I mean, a store manager makes, you know, six figures so that there's, there's sure. an end goal for me. I can get to that level. Um, Al owns Peach Waves now, so I help him with like the marketing and stuff. So that gives me that entrepreneurial sense that that keeps me alive. Um, you know, I wanted what I was very strong about not getting into concerts or the club again, like between HBO and then the doc and then the doc comes out and yeah. everyone's like, get back into the parties, this and that. There's got to be some pool there. Yeah. Like, so some, there was like, there was two days where I'm like, okay, I'm quitting Whole Foods and oh, I'm wow. going to open a club. Oh, and then, you know, but here we go back to that guided ambition. I've talked to like podcasters or guys in the industry or whatever. And they're like, listen, dude, you have a real chance here to like be one of those success stories where you're not doing what you did before. Mm-hmm. You know, you're coming out on top of this and you're turning this into in, a positive. And it really has to come down to you, how your talent. Like if I came here and I said, guys, I'm working on another nightclub you know, that would, that's, that's not what I need to be doing. So that, that image is gone. I had that like guidance to stay away from that. And, you know, right now I'm really focused on, on selling the story for like a TV series. I think it needs to be a TV series. We have the, the right people behind it and that will eliminate the debt, make everyone whole. Yeah. I, I don't think the, you know, just my opinion, I don't think the issue is the concerts. I think the issue is, you know, how you went about it. And I think that that'll follow you uh, no matter what you do, as long as you get excited about something. That's right. So uh, it's not the concerts aren't the issue. Now I know what you're, you're, it sounds like you're just being self-aware and like that space gets me thinking in ways that are probably not good, right. but you're going to run into other spaces that are going to do that to you. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, my, you know, so my advice to you is, is the ambition's great. You're a hustler, obviously mm-hmm. in, in a good way, but you got to be honest the whole time and you're going to, you're going to get your ass kicked a lot. It's just what happens when you're <laughs> yeah. an entrepreneur, but you got to be honest the whole time. Yeah, you got to face those hard encounters. And yeah. You, you got to be very transparent with people. Yeah. And everybody learns this as a kid. You just learned it the hard, like really hard way. 
But I learned this as, it, it, as a teenager. Like one lie turns into other lies that turn into much bigger. Every single one gets bigger and bigger. Well, speaking of that, you also, um, a lot of the people that you, you hurt or burned were, were friends. Are you, are you friends with anybody still or did you lose all your friends? Um, so a lot of like the, 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 um, like the kid investors, they were never really, when it all was said and done, they weren't necessarily owed money. It turns out they had made money cause they were early on, like with a Ponzi scheme, you know, those early investors, when they get Got paid it. out, it was more of their, the, the adults that had lost money oh. or people that came on later on. Mm-hmm. I'm in touch with, you know, a lot of them. I actually ran into Josh. I worked a wedding, um, for my dad last weekend and Josh was there. And I think, so during the trial and everything, I was like the most hated person in town, even though I was running tuxedos, like during this whole trial, booking all these major acts, because tuxedos is a whole nother, you know, side to this whole story. Um, but um, I was I was hated. The news was just saying Danbury kid defraud this and that, even up until the doc came out. But I think now there's some closure with the doc because they see kind of what my intentions were and they see, you know, for the first time, my side of the story, Yeah. Um, which didn't really come out at trial because you can't tell it in that way at of a course. trial. And, um, you know, I think some people, uh, you know, they look at the whole thing. I think they know, like some of them have reached out to say, listen, you messed up, but that, you know, they get their perspective. Yeah. Um, some of their dollar amounts were, were, were smaller so it's not like they had lost their whole life, yeah. you know, because of that. Um, I, I think there's a lot of things to look at. Everyone's going to, you know, form an opinion. But I also think now, ultimately, um, they're looking at the balls in my court. So what am I going to do with that next? Yeah, so yeah. everything I said in the doc is only true if I actually, you know, see it through. Yeah, so now through. it's on me. I have to run with this. I have to turn it into something, pay everyone back. And then I could say, and they could see the the intentions behind it. So looking back, uh, what do you can you recall, or do you remember like you know the most ultimate high moment of the whole story, and the most ultimate low moment of the or scariest moment of the whole story? I think the high moments were definitely you know that last obviously when I was first starting out that was high, but that was small scale. So the the, the highest moments you know were at Tuxedo Junction, which is like that period of time when I was being investigated up until the day I went to jail where I'm this 19, 20 year old kid running this, you know, growing EDM venue, booking the largest acts in the world, you know, Steve Aoki, the chain smokers adventure club. And I think a lot of, um, like now I'm looking at to see how big it, it actually was back then. I was just like, it was just, you know, me doing what I knew how to do. And that showed me going back to my roots booking these parties tuxedos was super successful i know i feel like there uh that there's huge opportunity just right i mean even when you tell the story and i'm listening to it i mean that was the beginning you were already showing profits early mm-hmm. early on before big names like that mm-hmm. uh it would be hard for me not to not to want to venture with you into something like that i mean i think the thing when like you were saying before the concerts and the party promotion i'm good at that's not the bad part but it's associating like that high risk. Like if I'm still in debt now, mm. how do you like, obviously I could have faith and know I'm going to do it right. But from the onlookers perspective, they don't necessarily know. So I think I have to build that trust and that would entail, you know, pay, paying everyone back and that's then, fair. then getting into that. That's a, right. that's a great that's uh, a good way to go. About yeah. It. I, I, I like that. Um, so what about the low moment? What was the ultimate low moment during the or scariest? low moment? I mean, there was so many, yeah. like at, at, at a very like even like with the drug dealers getting beat up or like guns pointed at you or well, hold on, a second. Yeah, you, hold didn't, on. you didn't talk. About yeah, you that. didn't talk about yeah. that. You got that your was in the, that was in the doc. Well, I know, but yeah. I want to hear yeah. about this. Okay, so I'll tell. I got two really good stories for you. So uh, the first story was um, I, I had gotten a hundred and fifty grand loan from this this drug dealer, and and um, he throws all the money at the table. And it was stacks, like wrapped in 20s. And I was 150 grand cash. Like, this is crazy. So I took the money and he was, you know, I I kept coming up with excuses about not paying it back, this and that, because I owed like 30 grand interest on this 150K. And um, eventually he sends his cousin down to see me. And um, I'm in the basement of tuxedos. And one of, you know, these guys are grabbing my wrist and they take like the end of the screwdriver. I'm like, well, what are you going to do with that? And he's like, oh, you'll see. And he, you know, he takes my hand, puts it out and he's just like whacking 
each finger with the end of the screwdriver and you wouldn't think it would hurt but then because he had a hammer right next to him but he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't using the hammer i thought shit i'm done he, he's gonna grab the hammer and then there's a staple gun next to that <laughs> but he grabs a screwdriver and he's just whacking my fingers and it was very unpleasant <laughs> I, I got the message <laughs> uh, you, paid, you paid him back yeah so a deal was worked out you know with my dad and and you know uh, it, it, there's a lot to it, okay. but I, I, I didn't end up dead uh, from the whole experience. <laughs> that's, um, that's good. You know, I really learned about like pushing people to their limits and kind of like y- you know how to read people mm-hmm. and you kind of see like people who you think are bad or, or vice versa or whatever, you know, like you, you learn to read and adapt to your s- surroundings. Yeah, oh, the, yeah. Nothing like that. So that's one story. Is that, yeah, or was, that, was that two and so one? So the second story is not related. It, it, it has to do with like the high moment. It has to do with the fire marshal. And I think you guys are going to love this one. So Steve Aoki, it, it was like this hyper glow show. Uh, the mayor cancels it at the Westcon, the university, um, and says they, they didn't want a hyper glow show. And at this point, we had a lot of problems with the town. The town was extorting me to use their ambulance service. Um, they were blackmailing me, making me pay thousands of dollars a night because they were in cahoots with the government trying to get my bond revoked. They didn't want me on social media. They didn't want this. They didn't want that. And um, what happens is from there, um, they're sending the fire marshal out every night to look at capacity. Mm. So one night the guy comes out, uh, he sees we're advertising a seven o'clock start time. So he comes right at seven o'clock and he's with a clicker. Uh, a capacity clicker because they rated our capacity at like 600 really the place could fit 2000 but Mm -hmm. they were screwing me pretty hard and um lucky for me you know we had sold 2500 tickets to the event but i opened doors two hours early so the guy comes to the door this fire marshal and he says ian how many people do you have inside i said we're at about five inside we just opened doors there was already 700 in the place. <laughs> so had he walked inside like he normally does, he would have said, you know, no more people. And the line's already around the corner. So he starts clicking at five. I have a team on the roof with walkie talkies down the street. We're directing kids in through the back door. And he's at the front door uh, <laughs> clicking these other people in. Uh-huh. And, you know, unbeknownst to him, we get 2,500 people in the place, the most tuxedos has ever done. And he does a walkthrough like at the end of the night. He's like, looks like you got about 800 kids in here, but it's okay. <laughs> 2,500 kids in the building, and this guy is saying there's about seven to 800 in there. Uh, that's oh, and, and that's just what we were dealing with every night. And the crazy part about it is, you know, one, my age. Two, I'm up against the federal government, like, on trial at the time when this is all happening. And three, just all the obstacles of running this business, which was completely legitimate. Um, you know, that, that, that venue was ran legitimately. I kept accurate accounting. Um, and there was no fraud involved with tuxedo. So had the old stuff not happened, tuxedos could have been successful. And, um, the problem was when I'd make money on a show, I'd use it to pay off old debt, Mm. whether it was like the, the drug dealers or this, or I was still paying interest payments to other kids to try to, you know, make sure they didn't testify or whatever. Like I was trying to, in good faith, I wouldn't say don't testify, but like, here's some money. So then when it came time to like, say, paint the chain smokers, you know, I used that show made a bunch of money that night, but I used the money to pay off other expenses and I didn't pay them for like three months, the chain smokers, their agent, you know, from AM only or whatever, or the CIA in California is blowing up my email every day. And I'm sitting there trying to sell off like coolers in tuxedos to, to pay off uh, their oh, fee. Oh so my! So it was just a lot of stuff. I'd go to the casino and um, the landlords were like, we're going to lock you out. I'd have a sold out show the next night. They say, we're locking you out at 6 a.m. So I would take whatever money I'd have, drive to the casino, win the, the money and and get back at 6 a.m. Because oh he, he would put bolts on the doors. Uh, and they would just bolt the place up. It was just all these Not crazy stories. Not stressful at all. Yeah. Yeah. It, w- it was just nuts. And then the club getting raided, I'd get taken out in handcuffs like 10 times for liquor violations or this and that. Oh my goodness. And, um, and you just keep going. Whoa. Yeah. So something the documentary doesn't get into that I was really curious. I mean, you did almost two and a half years in prison. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like for a, a kid, man? So prison is like, it's, it's everything you hear about on TV, but at the same time, it's not. I don't know, have you guys ever watched Orange is the New Black? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it's kind of similar to, and I'll tell you my experience. Um, when I first, you know, went to prison, I was in like a holdover in Rhode Island 
And that's like that stuff you see on like 60 days in or whatever. Like it's very like, like you're locked up certain movement, like, you know, the metal tables, it's, it's that prison vibe. But then when I went to like a low, a low security prison at, at Fort Dixon, New Jersey, it's just like this open compound. There's 5,000 people there. Everyone's different units. It's these old army barracks. And you would be surprised at the, the money people are making there. Everyone's good. They'd have like a liquor making business. They're making hooch. Like they'd put like these bags of rotting fruit and like the hide them in, in the walls to, to make hooch. Um, they were making like these little sterno things out of electrical wires to like make white lightning uh, vodka, like uh, melting down the honey or whatever. Um, there was the cell phone business, you know, guards would bring in phones and uh, other inmates were selling the phones. Like everyone had cell phones. It, 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 it's it's absolutely, it's like, it's, it's an enterprise in there. People are doing laundry. People are um, doing cleaning services. So it's just the dynamics. It's like high school, but for prisoners and that. Um, but then when I got to, I was moved around all over too. Um, I was in Philadelphia. I was in uh, New Jersey. I actually went to Danbury, which was right in my backyard. And um, I was in solitary confinement for six months because I had dated a guard's cousin. So it was a conflict of interest. <laughs> what? Yeah. So this, the girl I was dating throughout- uh, Conjugal visits and everything? <laughs> no, the girl I was dating throughout um, tuxedos, Yeah. her cousin was a guard there. So as soon as I got on the compound, uh, they lo- he, he, he reported- He didn't like you right away, huh? Well, he, no, he liked me, but it was his job, I guess, to report it. But meanwhile, I had other guards there that, um, that used to work security for me that didn't report our relationship- but with him, he was by the book, reported it. So they threw me under investigation because they didn't want like a guard being uh, like influenced by an inmate. Mm. And um, so I'm in solitary for six months in this like old, like think of like, um, like, you know, those old uh, like Alcatraz or whatever, yeah. with, like the bars or whatever yeah. it was an old style prison. And then they let me be like the orderly. I was painting the cells and doing this. And I was, my parents would see me like once a week because you get certain visits and very, very unpleasant, but that's how I lost all the weight. Cause you know, I was 180 pounds. And then when you're on a strict three meals a day at a certain time, your, your last dinner's at like three 30 in the afternoon. <laughs> um, it was very unpleasant, but then the last year of it, I was at a camp in, in Wisconsin and that's where you get like that country club, you know, thing that people talk about like club, uh, fed or, or yeah, whatever. Right, yeah. Um, there was no fence. It was very open. Guys were literally running through the woods to meet their wives to go to a hotel um, and then bringing back what duffel bags of, you know, protein powder. Uh, you guys would appreciate this. Like we were getting gym <laughs> show, shoes. Um, we had a whole um, uh, um, cinder block weight set set up. We made out of cinder blocks and it was just like a whole weight thing outside getting like the uh, uh, resistant bands in. Sounds actually pretty um, awesome. We were eating McDonald's every weekend, sushi, pizza, Chicago, deep dish bowls, <laughs> everything. It was literally club fed. There was 130 inmates for, you know, one one guard. Everyone had a cell phone and it, you're, you're in bed watching Netflix or doing this and doing that. And it, it was just absolutely wild. So the, it was like, Orange is a new black on steroids with what was going on there. Holy shit. I, every, wow, you know, I can't crazy. help but think the potential that you possess that you, <laughs> is, this is going to have to be a choice that you're going to have to make for the rest of your life. Am I going to do this the right way? Or the well, wrong even way? then, I bet, uh, I mean, with a hustler mentality, it's got to be tempting. You probably saw opportunity to make money and hustle in prison. Did that cross mm-hmm. your mind ever? Did you think about dabbling into some of the illegal shit that's going on inside a prison? So I did a couple things. Um, I, I did like, I, I played dice cause I had that, did. I had that gambling thing. So I was playing dice. I was taught CeeLo, which is like a street dice game and I was making good money, but you, you don't play for cash. You play for a mackerel. Like it's these packs of fish, <laughs> absolutely gross, but it's called like the chicken of the sea. And people would walk around with like a, a laundry bag with like a hundred mackerel, which would be a hundred bucks or books of stamps. Like a book of stamps was worth $10. So that was like the currency. And then you would send the books of stamps home. People would then Western Union, the money. Like every day I'm calling my dad, dad, I needed a Western Union, 200 to this person or 100 to this person. He's like, 
you know, what the hell are you doing over there? What's happening? And he was just like, he was genuinely worried because, you know, I was just like involved in all that. I had to be a part of it. And that got me into trouble at times because no one likes that, you know, young white kid that they thought was a sex offender. Um, (laughs) Because I I was labeled when I went to the low and you're dealing with these adults, it's called a chomo, a child molester. They're like, ah, he's a chomo. And you you have, they'll give you a, a notice. They'll say, hey, you know, you got a week to show your paperwork showing that, you know, what your charges are, that you you didn't rat anyone out. Oh, so they don't fuck you up. So, huh? yeah. so for a week, nobody knew. And and then they would they would check you in, which would mean like they would make you go to solitary if you turned out to be bad after they, you know, they beat the shit out of you. Mm-hmm. But um, luckily that never happened to me because the, guard, the guards tell them that too. Mm-hmm. Like if, if your paperwork's not good or, or you're a sex offender, they're going to tell you. They'll tell whoever. Um, Did you witness that cool. happening? Did you witness some dudes getting fucked oh, up? All the time. Like you hear some crazy stuff. I mean, at Fort Dix, it's mostly a sex offender compound. So that doesn't really happen. But in other areas, like the, the old like lock in, in the sock, um, like crazy stuff. People, you know, in the bathroom, guys, like the real hardened guys that have been down for a while, they would go to the shower with boots on, leave a chair in front of the shower and have like their boots and like a little shank in the boot like ready to go like because they came from the higher up prisons this stuff wouldn't happen in the lower prisons of course but they were always ready to go you'd have guys walking around with like these long rods tucked into their shorts just you know ready in case something happened wow mm. holy shit yeah. yeah all right so <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think we've covered a lot there. yeah yeah I, i'm very very curious i see why this could be a, a series right? yeah there's a lot more in there <laughs> i'm very curious to see uh how you end up in the next 10 years i really yeah. think i really think you got two paths here you got a choice we're rooting you for you man i really yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm rooting for you i hope i hope you do well, what do you Get guys some think good of mentors the doc? Uh, i thought it was great i mean that's why you're here like i i watched the documentary and i told these guys i saw it first right then i turned them on to it right away and i said you gotta watch this first of all i was uh generation hustle in in general i thought was a is phenomenal what they're doing. I think what mm-hmm. HBO Max is doing is great. Uh, and I thought your story was just so interesting. And now I I have a, a different background uh, than you do, but I, I'm a bit of a hustler. And I came from, a, a, my father committed suicide when I was really young. My mom moved into, had an abusive relationship after that. So I kind of grew up kind of fitting for myself and figuring things out. And I too made a lot of bad decisions in my early teens, you know, just tr- mine was more out of survival though, figuring things out, doing whatever it took to get by. Mm-hmm. So when I see a kid like you, where I'm sure some people are, you know, fuck that kid or whatever, I have a little more empathy because I can relate. I can go like, ah, you know, at that age, you start making that kind of money and stuff like that. And that's all you see as a kid. You don't really start to, you don't start questioning like, oh, is this ethical? Well, and- <laughs> you, every every kid makes those mistakes. You just made them big league. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, yeah, that's major. Yeah. That's the that's the difference. And then you got, and you, you had to pay the price for it. But I, I swear you got some potential, but you're going to have to do it the, the, the right way. Otherwise it's going to. Does H- Does HBO actually tell you like how the documentary is doing as far as how it's trending? Do you know numbers and stuff? I don't really know numbers. I know they'll like play with the episodes. Like they had moved me from two to 10 and they like, they switched the orders of it. Oh, interesting. Um, they do that to get viewers. Cause if you think about it, if someone's tweeting, go watch episode two and then it directs them to someone else to then watch that. So it's kind of like a smart marketing oh, sense. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, if you're that. putting up, hey, go watch episode three, but that turns out to really be another episode. Mm-hmm. So they'll they'll change the order. Um, you can also judge by who's reaching out. Like if they're interested in saying, hey, we want to do a podcast series or this and that, you know, then that that shows kind of there. there's hype behind it. Um, and and um, the showrunner really loved my episode. Mm. Um, I think my episode definitely stands out from the rest of them mm-hmm. um just in the sense of the way the story's told we had that live footage which was great from from it you got to see like that young me like actually in action it wasn't a reenactment yeah and i think it really leaves like that area where it's like did he do it intentionally what happened what went wrong what's the learning experience and, and it could leave like a positive ending um if things are able to turn around so now your plans now i know you said that even hbo was considering some kind of podcast or i mean obviously you're trying to wrap this into a tv series and are you actively trying to kind of pitch this put this together like get people behind it to to help you with that are you getting investors (laughs) (laughs) yeah listen is there opportunity (laughs) i have no intents to take money from anyone like ever like i just want to use my i'd rather work at mcdonald's and you know raise my own money before i I take someone else's money um but with the with the series i I have this producer who i 
I've been with, who's been with me all the way, really understands the story. And she's put in a lot of work, like character development and the stories and how episodes would look. And someone, a, a big production company reached out the other day and said, you know, we're very interested in making this uh, into a series. Um, and we're meeting with them in Manhattan on Wednesday. So I think there's definitely a lot of interest. We kind of knew that this would come from the HBO doc because in the doc, there's no money in, in documentaries. Mm-hmm. They don't pay the subject. Uh, I listened to Archie one. Right, and, yeah, he, he yeah, told us he that. he hits that. So it's not like I could pay everyone back from the HBO documentary. Mm-hmm. Right. What I needed from that was to get the exposure out there because no one in their right mind would want to work uh, with us without, like Archie said again, having you have to have something. You have to bring something to the table. So now we have this HBO doc, we have the storyline, you know, this has a lot of potential um, to turn into something. And uh, we see it as, as definitely a TV series. All right. Well, we'll I hope be you, looking out for that. I hope you do well, man. Yeah, Thank definitely you, man. rooting yeah, for you. We are so, rooting yeah. for you. Thanks for coming on the show. It was a fun conversation. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. All right. right this is the key to health and fitness success. This is one of the things I love most about fitness is if you stick to it long enough, it makes you feel empowered because... To, in order to get fit and to stay fit, you have to take responsibility. You can't say, it's my genetics. It's the way I was brought up. It's my bone structure. My parents were overweight. My mm-hmm. parents are unathletic. 